of God, grace that is greater than all our sin, all of our sin individually, all of our sin collectively, the grace of God has been brought to us and manifested to us in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Were it not for the grace of God, we would have no hope and we would not be here today. We would not be singing praises to God, for if there were no grace, we would have no reason to sing his praise. We would simply be lost sinners on our way to hell. Take your Bibles, if you will, please, and turn to that portion of text which we read just a few moments ago in Exodus chapter 3. We're on the tenth part today of our study of the names of God. God has revealed himself here in this portion of text, verses 13 through 15, by his name. And we've looked at the principal names of God, the eight different names that are given here in this passage. And we've also discovered that from them we have extended names of God, for these names are also used in compound form in many other portions of text which reveal to us the nature 
and the character of God. Last week we were looking at the descriptive titles that are given to the Father. And we noted that there are certain descriptive titles that are used for both the Father and the Son in that context of the names of God. But there are some names that are used only for God the Father. At least nine of them that are distinct from those titles shared with our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw the title God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, dealing with his eternality and his omniscience. We saw that name is also used as the source of all blessing and the source of our position in Christ. And we saw that as Peter uses that name, it is the source of mercy and the source of the new birth through Christ's resurrection. Then we looked at the name of the Father, calling him the Father of Mercies, which is, of course, one of the principal character qualities of the Father. Mercy, the practically applied results of being the God of comfort. And we noted the difference between mercy and grace last week. Grace extended to us as we are guilty. Mercy extended to us as we are miserable. Then we saw his name, and what an important name this is, where he is called Holy Father. Our Lord Jesus Christ addresses him this way in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17 and in verse 11. He speaks of God the Father as Holy Father. And we noted that Roman Catholics blasphemously use this name for the Pope, but it is a name that is reserved for God alone. We saw that name reflects the central character quality of God. In Isaiah 6, 3, one of the seraphim is crying to the others and crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. It is the holiness of God that causes Isaiah to crumble in his presence and confess that he is a man who is undone, a man who has unclean lips, a man who dwells in the midst of a people who are an unclean people because his eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, Jehovah Sabaoth, the name at which we have looked. We saw that that is the principal character quality of God which we as believers are to reflect. We saw that it first occurs in Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 7 where God commands his people to be holy. And then it's repeated twice in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 15 and again in verse 16. And we saw it as a command in Leviticus wedged between a curse on child sacrifice and demonism on the one hand. Then we find the command and then we find cursing parents and all forms of sexual immorality on the other side of Leviticus 20, verse 7. All of those sins we saw were prevalent in America today and also sins that are prevalent in the church. At least the named church. Those who call themselves Christians and yet who commit those same kinds of wicked evil. We are to be Obedient children, not lustful children. Peter wedges it between those commands of God. Not going according to the former lustful ways of our ignorant pagan life, on the one hand, and then following the command, a remembrance of the judgment of God. Holiness means that we are set apart. Set apart for service. Set apart for God. Holiness, we saw, is required in practical things. You and I cannot reflect the immutable attributes of God, his omniscience, his omnipresence, his omnipotence, but we are required to reflect the moral character of God. Holiness shows our new life in Christ as his servants. Just to summarize quickly all the verses we looked at, holiness is the foundation for receiving the promises of God. Holiness is the proof of our new position in Christ. Holiness proves the stability that shows we are looking for the imminent return of Christ. 
1 Thessalonians 3.13. Holiness is the mark of our heavenly calling to moral purity, 1 Thessalonians 4.7. Holiness is the mark of a godly marriage reflected, reflecting the created order and resulting in a great promise during childbearing, 1 Timothy 2.15. Holiness characterizes the manner of life of godly older women in the church. Holiness results from the chastening that God uses to achieve holiness in the life of every believer, Hebrews 12.10. And holiness, oh, how important this is. Holiness is not optional. Holiness is required. And there is a warning to those who take the doctrine of holiness lightly. Hebrews 12.14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That's where we ended last week, and today we continue as we look at the results of God's holiness. We see that because he is holy, he is called the Father of glory. Ephesians 1.17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. His holiness is what gives such incredible brilliance to his glory. The Father is called the Father of glory. Dear friends, as we consider the glory of God. We are talking about the manifestation of the Shekinah. We are talking about the magnificent glory by which God has revealed himself throughout Scripture. We're talking about the glory of God that exists in heaven. It is incomparable to anything that we have ever seen here on earth. The one who is the father of glory is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the dweller of the Shekinah glory, the throne sitter of the Shekinah glory, the one who reflects such glory in heaven that there is no need of the sun or of the moon in heaven. For the glory of God and of the Lamb are the light thereof. The Father is called the Father of glory. The next name that we see used of the Father, again by our Lord Jesus Christ, is Abba, Father. Abba, the word that is used in Hebrew today when little children run to their daddy and they call him Abba, Abba. I heard it perhaps hundreds, maybe even thousands of times when I lived in Israel. Abba, Abba, you'd hear it down the street. Some little child running after a father who had moved on after the child was still looking in a window someplace. Abba, Father. That's a word of intimate, personal relationship. Mark fourteen thirty six, And he said, Abba, Father. All things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me, nevertheless not what I will, but what thou wilt. There is so much in that verse. It's our Lord speaking in the garden. Just before the betrayal, just before the trials, just before the mocking and the scourging, and the road to Calvary. He comes into the presence of his father, Abba, Abba. It's the intimate, loving name that a child speaks to his father. It is a name which shows the Lord Jesus Christ has personal trust in the Father. All things are possible unto thee. 
a child who does not question, a child who is willing to submit to the will of the Father, not as I will, but what thou wilt. It's a beautiful name to call our Heavenly Father, Abba Father. Paul uses that name again over in the book of Romans. For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You can address God the Father in the same way in which our Lord Jesus Christ addressed him in the garden. In a few moments, we'll be coming to have the Lord's table here this morning. We're coming before our Heavenly Father, commemorating the death of His Son. We can come to Him, because the veil has been rent, and now we have access to Heavenly Father, our Abba Father in Heaven. And that is the next name that we find used of Him. In fact, one of the most frequently used names applying to the Father exclusively is the name Heavenly Father. Our Lord Jesus Christ uses it on multiple occasions. I'll give you only a few. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 14, and then verse 26, and then again in verse 32. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. Verse 26. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Verse 32. After speaking of all these things of the world, it says, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. That first verse that we read reminds us that our Heavenly Father knows what we're doing. If you forgive men their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. He knows when you actually forgive. He doesn't merely see the words that you say. He knows when you forgive in your heart. The Heavenly Father is an omniscient Father. I suppose most of us, as we were growing up, at some point in our childhood, felt like, as the old saying goes, our mother or our dad had eyes in the back of their head. How did they know that I did that? Well, sometimes we got away with it when we were dealing with our earthly parents. But you never get away with it when you're dealing with your heavenly parents. Father. He always knows. That second verse, verse 26, tells us that our Heavenly Father not only knows, but He always provides. Jesus reminds them, don't you realize that there are birds out there and your Heavenly Father is feeding them? And then He says, are ye not much better than they From God's divine viewpoint, you are not an animal. You are much better than they. Scriptures tell us this on multiple occasions. Those people who are into the environmentalist movement today, those people who are into this, you know, save the whales movement today, and those people who give more rights to an unborn eagle egg than they do to unborn human beings, do not understand, from God's perspective... We are special of all of his creation. We are special in his sight. And he, as our Father, provides for us. Our Lord Jesus Christ gave many illustrations of that. He talked about eggs and fish and bread, and he talked about stones and serpents and scorpions. And he says, your fathers on earth give you good things. Will not your heavenly Father give you good things? Yes, he will. Are you one of his children? I pray that you are. 
If so, you can call him Abba, Father. If so, you can refer to him as your heavenly Father. Jesus gives other illustrations in Matthew 15, but he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. The Heavenly Father is one who examines what we're doing. He's one who roots up the plants that he has not planted. In chapter 18, So likewise shall my Heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. There's a principle in scripture called the law of harvest. What you sow is what you reap. How much you sow determines the amount that you will reap. The nature of what you sow determines the nature of what you reap. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that reap, soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Luke 11, 13. We mentioned this a moment ago, but let me read it to you. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your... Dear people, it's not just the, it's your. It's just not a heavenly father, it's your heavenly father. Give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. We have doctrinal explanation of that as we get into the epistles where the apostle Paul is explaining to us about the filling of the spirit of God and the walk of the flesh versus the walk of the spirit. But we move to the next title of the father. He is called the father of spirits. Hebrews 12.9 Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? This is one of the five main warning passages that are contained in the book of Hebrews. Passages that deal not with loss of salvation, though the Arminians have tried to make them say that, but five passages that deal with loss of rewards and divine chastening. Whom the Father loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he will. Just like our earthly fathers chastened us, our heavenly Father also chastens us as his children. He is a stern disciplinarian as well as a God of infinite love and grace. And because he has given us the power to obey through the indwelling Holy Spirit, he expects us to obey. And he spanks us when we do not. Shall we not rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? The five warning passages remind us that part of chastening for a child who is recalcitrant, for a child who resists the discipline of his father, the final form of discipline is death. Shall we not rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? The next name that we find used of God the Father is Righteous Father. Clearly close to Holy Father, but with a different emphasis in terms of the results of character. Our Lord Jesus Christ again speaking in the high priestly prayer in John 17 and you remember that is a prayer that he is praying for you. I pray not for these only, but for them who will believe on me through their word. That's you and me. That's extended prayer from 2,000 years ago down today to 
Bible Presbyterian Church in Collingswood. Jesus prayed that prayer for you if you're a believer. Now he addresses him as righteous father. O righteous father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. Now listen to this last phrase. Listen to it carefully because it also applies to you, just like the rest of this prayer. I have known thee, and here it is, and these have known that thou hast sent me. There is a connection through Christ to the Father. It is a positional connection. It is a connection of knowledge and understanding. It is a connection, as Christ prays in this prayer, it is a connection which brings us the Father's character flowing into our lives. Then we find the title, this is the ninth of those titles, Father of Lights. Again, emphasizing the character quality of the Heavenly Father. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the, fathers, from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Every good gift, every perfect gift comes down from the Father, from the Father of lights. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the light of the world. This is the Father of lights. This is the one by whom all is illuminated. This is the one who does not change. It is a faithful light that does not waver. With whom is no variableness. With whom is no shadow of darkness. This is an all-permeating light that permeates through anything that might cause a shadow and reveals not only the external, but reveals the internal. With whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Names that relate to the Father. As we've mentioned before, and I say it just in passing at this point, there are over 300 titles or designations in the Bible which refer to the second person of the Trinity, our Lord Jesus Christ. We've covered some of those, we'll not cover all of them, but they are titles that clearly refer to Christ. So we move now to the Holy Spirit. It's rather interesting. As you look at the names of the Father, there are many, but they are far outnumbered by the names given to the Son which are given distinctly to him. Some shared by father, some shared by son and father together. But we move to the Holy Spirit, and there are no specific names of the Holy Spirit revealed in Scripture, although he is known by descriptive titles. No specific names, but descriptive titles. It's interesting because the Holy Spirit, as Jesus explained in the Upper Room Discourse, would not point to himself, he would point to Christ and would show things to come. So when you get into a church where it spends all of its time talking about the Holy Spirit, such as the charismatic churches, with a de-emphasis on pointing to Christ, but pointing rather to the Spirit and what the Spirit is doing and what the gifts are that are being given and all the razzmatazz that goes around with falling on the floor and rolling around and having people put blankets over you and speaking in tongues and gibberish and being slain in the Spirit and the guy standing in the pulpit saying somebody out there has got a, a physical problem, come up here, smacks him on the forehead, knocks him over. Folks, the Spirit always points to Christ. So we have descriptive titles of the Spirit, but no specific names are given to him. Let me give you some of the descriptive titles. We find that he is called the Spirit of God 26 times in Scripture. In fact, that occurs from the earliest verses of Genesis all the way into the doctrinal epistles. Genesis 1-2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. 
Our Lord Jesus Christ is the Creator, but the Holy Spirit and the Father are both involved at creation. We find Ephesians 4, over in the doctrinal epistles, Paul says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. He's called the Spirit of God 26 times. He is also called the Spirit of Christ twice in the New Testament. Rather interesting, we find three different titles for the Holy Spirit are seen together in Romans chapter 8, verse 9. And that title, the Spirit of Christ, is found there with the other two. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. There's the first title. If so be that the Spirit of God, there's the second title, dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. There are those who teach that you can be saved and then get the Holy Spirit as a second blessing. This verse says, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You cannot be saved and not have received the Holy Spirit of God to permanently indwell you at the very moment of your salvation. We're discussing what about those anomalies in the book of Acts. If you want to know about those, come on Sunday evening. But the scripture makes it clear that for us today, if any man has not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you're a believer, the Holy Spirit indwells you. That means everywhere you go, he's with you. Everything you say, he hears. Every thought you think, he's resident and observes it. If you were really cognizant of that at all times, would you think and say and do things that are different? Would your motives be called into check Would all the things that permeate your life suddenly find barriers there that they can't get around? The Holy Spirit, if you're a believer, lives inside of you. Oh, that doesn't eradicate your old sin nature. That doesn't remove your human spirit. That doesn't mean that you are suddenly sinlessly perfect. But he is there and he is present and he is always available to empower you to walk by faith, to walk in the spirit, to walk in a way that is pleasing to God. We don't always choose that. We all sin. First John chapter 1 verses 8 and 10 make it clear that if we deny our sin nature, if we deny that we sin, we're liars. The Holy Spirit lives in you to make it possible for you to walk in the light. And so he is called the Spirit of Christ. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. We find the term by which we most frequently speak of him, the Holy Spirit, used only seven times in Scripture. Rather interesting. We find three of those in the Old Testament. We find four of those in the New Testament. We saw in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, we saw that the Spirit of God is clearly his title there, but he is called the Holy Spirit of God there. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. That, by the way, is the reason for your eternal security. You are sealed unto the day of redemption. If you look at Romans chapter 8 in that great list of all the things that God has done for us, it goes back into eternity past with the purposes of God. It extends into eternity future with our glorification, and there are no leaks along the way. God, according to his eternal purpose, called us and chose us and guaranteed that we'd be saved. But God guarantees also we're going to reach glorification. Not one will be lost. Our Lord Jesus Christ promised that. You and I have eternal security because of a special work of the Holy Spirit. And that is the Spirit seals us unto the day of redemption. What an exciting thought. Someday our bodies will be redeemed. Someday we'll no longer have these sin-cursed bodies Either we'll die and go immediately to be with the Lord, or the rapture will occur and we'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds and our bodies will be changed 
In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. All of theology ties together, folks. If you're consistent in your theology, it changes your life. It's those areas of inconsistency where our lives are not changed that we begin to wonder and question theology. But the touchstone is scripture, not experience. I must move on. Other places where he is called the Holy Spirit. And one that's very important for us to understand, Psalm 51, 11. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. That's a prayer that David prayed that you and I cannot pray today, because Jesus promised that the Spirit would abide with us forever. The Spirit had a new work beginning on the day of Pentecost. The Spirit came and began a new work in the lives of the apostles. And suddenly we see an expansion outside of national Israel and we move from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth as we get down to Acts 10 and the Gentiles come in and as we move through the rest of the book of Acts and there's this expansion of the gospel to everyone around the world. The Holy Spirit begins a new work. He didn't do this in the Old Testament. But he's doing it today. It's what we call missions. We find he is called just the Spirit 248 times. Just the Spirit. For example, Paul speaks this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. He's called, and our time is running out, but I'll move quickly through these. He is called the Comforter four times in the New Testament. Jesus speaks of him this way in John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. The Comforter, the Paraclete, if you were with us on Sunday evenings, you know the study, the word study that we did on that Jesus was a comforter, and he says, I'll send you another comforter. And he uses the word alos, which means another comforter of the same kind. Not a heteros comforter, another of a different kind. But another comforter, one who will be like, I am with you. He will be with you. He will abide with you forever. We find he is spoken of as the Holy Ghost 89 times. Mark 1 8, I indeed baptize you with water, but ye shall be baptized, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost are the same. Then we find he's called the Spirit of Truth four times. John chapter 14, 15, 16, 1 John 4. Even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Every time you tell a lie, do you realize what you're doing? You are grieving the spirit of truth. He's not only with you, he's in you. Every time you lie, you're denying that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And you are trusting the devil every time you tell a lie. Who is the father of all lies? John 8, 44. Satan is the father of lies. When you tell a lie to try to get out of whatever problem you're in, you have just decided not to trust in Jesus, who is the truth. You have decided to trust in the devil, who is a liar and the father of it. The Holy Spirit is also the spirit of truth. But when the Comforter is come, whom I shall send unto you from the Father, even the spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. We spoke of that earlier. The spirit always points to Christ. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come. He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. The spirit of truth does not guide you into error. The spirit of truth does not guide you into confusion. The spirit of truth does not guide you into immorality or wickedness or rebellion against God. The spirit of truth guides you into truth. 
Dear people, truth is important. It is doubly important because the spirit of truth dwells in you. Oh, how he is grieved. When we turn aside the deception and lies, what hypocrisy. The last verse on that, 1 John 4, 6. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Discerning the doctrines of demons in context, discerning bad theology in context, discerning attacks on the person and work of Christ in context, there is the spirit of truth and there is the spirit of error. Well, we cannot go on with other names at this point or designations. Rather, there are 20 different designations for the Holy Spirit in Scripture. But we see that when a descriptive adjective is added to the word spirit, the word holy outnumbers all of the other descriptive adjectives. That brings us back to the holiness of God where we spent most of our time last week. Holiness is the principal character of God. Holiness is the manner of life to which God has called us. Holiness is the principal character quality that reveals a life of genuine faith and a life of genuine walking in the Spirit. I think it's significant for us to remember that as we come this morning to the Lord's table. Holiness. God has called us to come with clean hands and a pure heart. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again that you are a holy God. And you are a righteous God, a God that requires payment for sin. Not only are you holy in your character, but you've called us to holiness. Not only are you holy in your character, which you could be and exist sublimely for all of eternity, without any of your creation, but you are also righteous, a manifestation of your holiness against sin. A part of your character which requires that sin must be judged. We had no holiness of our own. We had no righteousness of our own. But we did have sin that had to be judged. And so in your great grace and great wisdom and mercy, you sent the Lord Jesus Christ to be the bearer of our sins. In his own body, he bore our sins on Calvary's tree. And there at Calvary, you poured your wrath and judgment upon him. He took our place. And you placed us safely inside of him. From eternity past. Oh, the amazing grace and counsels of God. He hath borne the iniquity of us all. The infinite God-man in a finite period of time bore the infinite wrath of the Father. Father, we pray that as we come before you today, crying, Abba, Father, that you will cleanse our hearts and our minds, our hands, of all sin and wickedness, of all false purpose and evil motive, that we might come before you confessing our sins, knowing that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, for this we thank you in the name of your blessed Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.